Judge Ketanji Jackson has officially been confirmed to the Supreme Court. President Biden is pleased, probably because Jackson's confirmation is the first political win of his entire administration. But even so, Biden is angry that the confirmation didn't go even easier. I knew it wouldn't be easy, but I knew the person I nominated will be put through a painful and difficult confirmation process. But I have to tell you, what Judge Jackson was put through was well beyond that. There was verbal abuse, the anger, the constant interruptions, the most vile, baseless assertions and accusations. In the face of it all, Judge Jackson showed the incredible character and integrity she possesses. The most vile, baseless assertions and accusations. The most vile, baseless assertions and accusations. Does Joe Biden not remember four years ago? Well, actually, probably he does not remember four years ago. But does everyone else not remember four years ago when during Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearings, the Democrats accused him, a squeaky clean, milquetoast federal judge, of attempted rape? I believed he was going to rape me. I tried to yell for help. When I did, Brett put his hand over my mouth to stop me from yelling. This is what terrified me the most and has had the most lasting impact on my life. It was hard for me to breathe, and I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. Dr. Ford, with what degree of certainty do you believe Brett Kavanaugh assaulted you? 100%. What is the strongest memory you have? indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter, the the uproarious laughter between the two, and they're having fun at my expense. Was there ever a time when you drank so much that you couldn't remember what happened or part of what happened the night before? No. no. In your yearbook, uh, you talked about drinking and sexual exploits, did you not? Indelible in the hippocampus is the laughter that I engaged in at this preposterous circus. There was no evidence for any of these claims, none whatsoever. That woman, Christine Ford, changed almost all of the crucial details of her story multiple times. She was caught in multiple lies. The other people said to have been at this party from hell at the time, said they had no idea what this woman was talking about. Even Ford's best friend, also said to have been there, contradicted Ford's story. But that didn't stop Democrats from continuing to smear Brett Kavanaugh without any evidence as a rapist, and then even going further to accuse him of gang rape. A third woman is now leveling damaging accusations against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Her name is Julie Swetnick, and she's represented by attorney Michael Avenatti of Stormy Daniels fame. Swetnick claims that Kavanaugh was present while she herself was being gang raped at a house party in the 1980s. The detail includes and what is included in Kavanaugh's sworn affidavit, excuse me, in Avenatti's sworn affidavit that Julie Swetnick gave. In it, she says, in approximately 1982, I became the victim of one of these gang or train rapes where Michael Judge, Mark Judge, and Brett Kavanaugh were present. Shortly after the incident, I shared what had transpired with at least two other people. During the incident, I was incapacitated without my consent, unable to fight off the boys raping me. I believe I was drugged using quaaludes or something similar placed in what I was drinking. She also says, quote, I also witnessed efforts by Mark Judge, Brett Kavanaugh, and others to cause girls to become inebriated and disoriented so they could then be gang raped. Gang raped. They said that Brett Kavanaugh was a gang rapist. Now, this woman, Julie Swetnick, was discredited almost immediately. Even the Democrats quickly moved on from her nonsense. Uh, Her felon lawyer, who was previously best known for defrauding a porn star, is currently in prison for extortion and wire fraud. But to this day, to this day, Democrats continue to smear Brett Kavanaugh as some sort of rapist with these vague accusations based on absolutely nothing. This after the Democrats, led by Joe Biden, baselessly smeared Clarence Thomas as a sexual predator. That after the Democrats, again, led by Joe Biden, because he's been in politics for that long, inaugurated this whole era 
of Supreme Court confirmation smears during the nomination of Robert Bork. It created a new verb, borking, which is when you smear a candidate for the court. Now, Joe Biden has the audacity to complain about vile, baseless accusations against Ketanji Jackson, which consisted entirely of quoting her own record and asking her basic questions about the world. And I'll confess, Judge Jackson, as, as, look, as I listen to your testimony, I believe you are someone who is compassionate. I believe you care for children, obviously your children and other children. But I also see a record of activism and advocacy as it concerns sexual predators that stems back decades and that is concerning. You said to him, this is a truly difficult situation. I appreciate that your family's in the audience. I feel so sorry for them and for you and for the anguish this has caused all of you. I feel terrible about the collateral consequences of this conviction. And then you go on to say sex offenders are truly shunned in our society. I'm just trying to figure out, Judge, is he the victim here or the victims the victims? Uh, Judge, you, you, you've, spoken, you've spoken a lot today about criminal sentencing, about the theory of sentencing. You've written about, a lot about it in your record. It is a very simple question. Is someone more likely or less likely to commit crime if they're certain, more certain that they're going to be caught, convicted, and sentenced? Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? You can't? You can't? The, the entire process was just quoting her own record, almost entirely in her own words, quoting her own sentencing record, and then asking simple questions like, what is a woman? And this woman, maybe she's a woman, maybe she's not, I don't know. Either way, she couldn't answer. The only vile and baseless accusations in the entire Jackson confirmation process have been the ones that Biden and the Democrats have hurled against the Republicans about the process. In other words, business as usual. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment on Friday is from William C., who says, there's nothing I want more now than to have Ashton Kutcher come out and inform us all that we've been punked. I'm with you. I, and now with the proliferation of deep fakes and Photoshop becoming very advanced, when I see something about Joe Biden and the White House, my first instinct is to say this isn't real. This can't possibly be real. This is so pathetic. There's no way. And then I look into it and it turns out that it is real. When you want to see things clearly, when you want to shed a little light, for instance, on your home, I would recommend you check out Hunter Douglas. Right now, go to hunterdouglas.com slash Knowles. I did not realize this before I got my house in Nashville and really started to take a little more care into the way I was living, to, you know, no longer living on a, a pile of uh, magazines on the floor, but actually taking care about the beauty of my home. Windows and window treatments, I think they might be the single most important thing in your home because it determines how the light comes in. It, it, it totally shapes how you live in your home. Hunter Douglas has incredible designs, gorgeous fabrics, control systems so advanced they can be scheduled to automatically adjust to their optimal position throughout the day as the sun moves through the sky. It's incredible. The shades diffuse the harsh sunlight. They cast this beautiful glow across the room. It's phenomenal. Take my word for it right now. Go to Hunter Douglas, make your home beautiful. That's hunterdouglas.com slash Knowles. Head over there today. Get your free Style Get Smarter design guide with fresh takes, creative ideas, and smart solutions for dressing your windows. Hunterdouglas.com slash Knowles for your free design guide. There was a clip going around Friday afternoon. I said this cannot be real. I do not believe it. Even Joe Biden, as senile and far gone as he is, there's no way this is real. Joe Biden, during the Ketanji Jackson confirmation process, right now she's going to be on the court, he tried to sum up America in one word. Tell me if you can figure out what that word is. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in the, foot, uh, foot, foot, excuse me, the foothills of the Himalayas with Xi Jinping, traveling with him. And that's when we traveled 17,000 miles when I was vice president. I don't know that for a fact. The one word that sums up America is, I was already in the foothills of the Himalayas of Xi Jinping. 
You know, I think, was it ben, Benjamin Franklin who said that? Or it might have been George Washington who said, America, if I had to sum up America, my fellow countrymen in one word, it would be, and I couldn't have made the Jinping. Is that it? No. It, it's sad because obviously that the word is nonsense. But also, even if he hadn't had a, a spark go off in his brain so that he just stammered for uh, three minutes, even if that hadn't happened, he said, I'm going to sum up America in one word and then proceeded to talk about a trip he had to the Himalayas with Xi Jinping that was not in one word and was completely unrelated to what he was talking about. The guy is just not, I didn't believe it when I saw it. I said, there's no way this is real, but it is real. It is real. He, he, Biden at this point, seems almost ancillary to the operation of the White House. This is why when Barack Obama showed back up, no one wanted to talk to Joe Biden. People want to talk to the person with the power, okay? People want to be around the person with the influence. And no one is paying any attention to Joe Biden. You can even see Katanji Jackson in the background there. Oh gosh, why? This is so, I've worked my whole career for this. And now this, this guy is just stammering idiotically. Some people, though, are a slightly more articulate than Joe Biden. Cory Booker thanking God for sending us Katanji Jackson. Just finished the vote. Uh, Katanji Brown Jackson has now been confirmed by the Senate to be a justice on the Supreme Court. And I think there are a lot of people who can appreciate this, that there is a lot of hurt in this world. There is a lot of private pain and personal injury. And we live in a nation with acres of ground that's been watered with tears and sadness. But today is a mountain of joy. Today is a day for celebration. Today I rejoice. I, I cry tears of joy. And I just want to thank God and thank this extraordinary woman for persevering through all of life's challenges, for overcoming all of life's obstacles, and now rising and knowing as when I talk to her, she knows that we as a nation rise, rise with her. We rise, we, we rise with her. I would like to implement the Cory Booker don't be a weirdo for five minutes challenge. I'm willing to put a million dollars on the line for this. I'll borrow money if I have to. Uh, it's the Cory Booker stop being a total weirdo for five minutes challenge. I'm willing to wager that money because it's impossible. It can't happen. We're better. We're rising. I rejoice. Re- rejoice for what? Rejoice for what? The, the, Answer for the left is that they're just happy that she's black and that she's a woman. That's all this nomination has ever been about. Don't take my word for it. That's what Joe Biden said. Joe Biden said, I am going to nominate a black woman. That's all I care about. And so I'm going to pick one, basically throw a dart at a wall. Oh, Katanji Jackson. Okay, it's her. She's the one. And that's all anyone cares about. She's obviously not the smartest person ever put on the court. She doesn't know what a woman is. She's by far the most radical. I guess that's something that the Democrats are excited about as well. She doesn't like America. She's endorsed the completely dishonest 1619 project, which says America is intrinsically evil and the revolution was fought to protect slavery. She supports critical race theory. She lauds the founders of critical race theory, critical race theory, which holds that America is intrinsically rotten right down to the core. This is terrible news. This is terrible news for the Supreme Court and for America. So it's no surprise, of course, that the Democrats are thrilled. The country is breaking. When you want to protect things in your home from breaking, you got to check out American Home Shield. Right now, go to ahs.com slash Knowles. I can promise you two things. I can promise you one, you will never want to fix your household breakdowns. You will not expect them. You will not want to fix them. And two, they're going to happen. Those are the two things I can promise you. So when they happen, make sure that you are protected with a plan from American Home Shield to help cover the costs to repair and replace things like your heating system, like your AC, like your fridge, especially now that costs are going through the roof, the economy is on the fritz. Make sure you are protected. They've got new options to help you find just the right coverage. If American Home Shield can't repair the covered item, they'll just replace it. American Home Shield members get more, more coverage options, fewer exclusions. You're talking HVAC systems, plumbing, kitchen appliances. They help protect parts of up to 23 essential home systems 
and appliances, no matter how old those systems and appliances are. Right now, you get 50 bucks off for our listeners. Keep your home up and running. Keep your budget on track with American Home Shield. Right now, our listeners get 50 bucks off their most comprehensive plans ever. AHS.com slash Knowles. Head over there, save 50 bucks. That's AHS.com slash Knowles for $50 off any plan. American Home Shield, be sure with the shield. Service fees, limitations, and exclusions apply. See plan for details. Even Cory Booker, with his bizarre rants and his Spartacus moments and his tears of anger and wrath, even Joe Biden, with his completely nonsensical stammerings and his brain made of pudding, neither of them are my least favorite Democrats running the country right now. My actual least favorite, and this has been true for two years, this has been true going back to the Democrat primaries, my least favorite one is Pete Buttigieg. And I feel vindicated in my distaste for Pete Buttigieg because Buttigieg just went on with the cackling hens on the view. And he was asked what he thinks about the Florida law, parental rights and education, the law which says that kindergarten teachers can't trans the five-year-olds. And Pete Buttigieg said that he believes that the law will kill children. He's been a vocal critic of what's co- going on in my state of Florida when the, with the so-called don't say gay law now, um, which he says will kill kids. Do you agree? And, you know, as a, as a politician, because this, this strikes you as, you know, your husband is a teacher. Yeah. You are uh, obviously LGBTQ yourself and you are now a parent. Yeah. So how do you feel about yeah, this? Yeah, he, he's right. And, and I think every law ought to be judged for the effect it's going to have on real people in real life. And I, I get the political reasons why they're doing this. By the way, some of those political reasons, is they don't have a plan on anything else, right? I mean, they, they, they don't have a plan on dealing with inflation or, or, or dealing with, <laughs> with gas prices or, or dealing with the issues of, of the day. We can't get home insurance in Florida. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to get... I'll get to the main point that Pete Buttigieg is making, which is extremely stupid. But first, I've got to get to that. The second point, he says, the reason they're, the reason they're preventing us from lopping off the genitals of five-year-olds is because they don't have a plan on gas. <laughs> you know, they don't have a plan on inflation and the economy. All of that was going great when we were running the show, dum-dum. And then you guys got in charge, and all of a sudden, inflation goes through the roof and hits a 40-year high, and, and gas prices also hit all-time record highs. And we know exactly why that happened, by the way. It, that happened because you shut down oil pipelines, you shut down oil production in America, then you gave Vladimir Putin a pipeline, you okayed the pipeline that we Republicans had shut down, the, the pipeline which Zelensky says was the cause of the war, that was the immediate cause of the Russian invasion because Biden lifted the sanctions off the oil pipeline, and now you've got a major war in Ukraine, which is very important not only to Europe, but to, to energy production around the world, and now gas prices are through the roof. So, and, and now you have the audacity to look at us and say, you don't have a plan. Here's my plan. Don't give Putin a pipeline. Give Americans a pipeline. Stop printing money like drunken sailors and, and just do what we were doing under Trump when everything was working. That's the first part. That's the, I guess that's the second stupid thing that Buttigieg said. But then to his main point, he says that the law in Florida, which prevents you from introducing five-year-olds to transgenderism in public school classrooms, The law in Florida, which stops teachers from encouraging five-year-old kids to take cross-sex hormones and lop off their genitals, he says that law is going to kill kids. Pete Buttigieg, who supports abortion. So, So abortion, which literally kills kids, that does not kill kids, according to Pete Buttigieg. Letting five-year-olds keep their genitals and not encouraging them to take cross-sex hormones that will kill kids. I didn't think I could like Pete Buttigieg less than I already did, but I do. Frankly, I liked him better when he was on maternity leave. Do you remember Buttigieg becomes the transportation secretary? We've got a major supply chain crisis and everyone started criticizing Buttigieg because he was nowhere to be found because he was on maternity leave. Pete Buttigieg was out, I guess, recovering from his C-section. Maybe he was chest feeding. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing, but Buttigieg was out for months not doing his job as a cabinet secretary. And I actually liked him better then because then he wasn't running his mouth. He was just living life as a private citizen, which is where he should be. Now he's coming out and saying, we need to trans the kids. And he does it in this way 
to make it sound like we're the unreasonable ones. The, the vast majority of Americans who support the Florida law, we're the unreasonable. You know, these guys, it's just for political reasons. <laughs> and look, I get it. I get their political reasons, but we have to, we have to trans the kids or, we'll, or that will kill them. And this is what they say, by the way. This is, you know, how desperate the Democrats are on this. They've got no argument whatsoever for transing the kids because it's just an, an absolute, it's the most outrageous thing they've done since they legalized the nation, national killing of little babies in the womb. But they've got no answer here. So they say, well, if you don't let us trans the kids, they're, they're going to kill themselves. This is, what, this is what abusive girlfriends and boyfriends do. If you leave me, I'm going to kill myself. If you do anything, I'm going to kill. This is, it's the exact same tactic. If you don't let us trans the kids, they're going to kill themselves. That's not true. First of all, there's no evidence. There's no social scientific evidence for the claims that they're making. That if we don't put kids, if we, if we don't uh, allow people to chop off parts of their bodies and mutilate themselves, that they're, they're going to kill themselves. The rates of suicide, depression, anxiety, and all the rest of it in post-op and pre-op transgender people, that is people who are suffering sexual confusion, are almost exactly the same. I don't really buy statistics generally. I don't really buy social science, but I'm more than happy to quote it when it backs up my view. And that's what's going on here. So even if their premise were right, that uh, if rates of anxiety and depression and suicide went down after mutilating your body, that therefore we should do it. Even if that were right, it's, it, 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 it's not true in reality. But, but furthermore, what Buttigieg is showing here is an important issue that we've got to confront on transgenderism, which is we can't split the baby on it. It's got to be all or nothing. Either transgenderism is real and we've got to endorse the surgeries or it's false and it's not real. And a man can't secretly be a woman and our souls actually do have something to do with our bodies. And that's it. Because if transgenderism is real and if the surgeries can better help you to deal with your gender dysphoria, then for sure we should do it in kids, right? If the idea is that puberty is, is the real cause of this discomfort, or it greatly accelerates the sexual discomfort people have because one is really a woman, but then he takes on all of these much more masculine secondary sex characteristics, then of course you should put the kid on puberty blockers. If, it, if, he, if the kid is really a woman, and by some quirk of biology, he becomes much more of a man, then of course you should stop that. So I, I, there's a kind of inner logic to the left's view on transgenderism. The problem is that the premise is false because a man can't secretly be a woman. So you got to reject the whole thing, okay? And the squishes need to, need to stop trying to find some conciliatory middle ground. There's no middle ground. And the libs obviously aren't going to stop. They are now presenting transing the kids as though it were the most common sense, ordinary thing. And if you oppose transing the kids, that you were some sort of horrible bigot or some cynic political operative rather than what you actually are, which is a person with at least a, a tenuous slight grasp on reality, unlike Pete Buttigieg, unlike the entire left. They're not going to stop. They're not going to stop with adults can, consenting adults can do whatever they want. An adult can chop off his body parts if he wants. They're not going to stop. It's going to go all the way down to little kids and little toddlers and little babies. They're already doing that stand up now. People say, well, are you going to die on this hill? I don't intend to die on any hill, but if you don't stand up on a hill and fight, you're going to just completely concede the whole battle. If you haven't heard of Ben's new Third Thursday Book Club, now's your chance to sign up. Last month, he took members through his analysis of uh, Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. You can watch it now at dailywire.com slash watch. Third Thursday Book Club. It's a live experience where you get to engage with Ben in real time, ask questions, and comment on the book. Uh, today, uh, we've got a new trailer. Check it out. I want to tell you about my third Thursday book club. This is not your average book club. These are the greatest books in the history of Western literature. We're going to dive into the greatest works of all time. These are the books that helped form the key pillars of Western civilization and helped define America. And we're going to do it live with thousands of you, our Daily Wire members. I'm going to be your personal guide. I've read every one of these books. I'm going to draw out the important lessons and themes from every book. Plus, I'm going to be answering your questions along the way. So we actually do read the book together. You join the book club, you are going to get smarter. You're going to get more knowledgeable because this is an investment in your most valuable asset, your mind. The third Thursday book club, it's going to change the way you think. This month's book is The Once and Future King by T.H. White. Sign up now for thirdthursdaybookclub.com to get Ben's notes sent straight to your inbox for 
The Once and Future King by T.H. White. We'll be right back with a lot more. You remember that abortion story down in Washington, D.C.? It's the most horrifying news story I've ever seen in my life, probably. Certainly in the top three. It's that these five babies were discovered. They, they look like babies. They don't look like a clump of cells. They look very clearly like babies. They were killed very likely in violation of federal law. They may have been killed for partial birth abortions. The abortionist who's doing it, Dr. Cesare Santangelo, has gotten completely let off the hook here. And actually, the authorities are only looking into the pro-lifers the ones who exposed these heinous crimes, about as heinous a crime as it gets, cries out to God for vengeance. These pro-lifers are the ones being attacked. And the DC mayor, Muriel Bowser, has just accused Lauren Handy and the other pro-lifers of tampering with fetal remains. Bowser has called this extremist anti-abortion activity, just taking photos, just taking photos of the reality of abortion. That's what's called extremist anti-abortion activity. It's so extreme because it's so extremely effective because abortion is completely unsupportable if you actually see the reality of it. So Bowser has said this is extremist anti-abortion activity, and this woman is guilty of tampering with fetal remains. And then I just have one question. So what? What's the big deal? Who cares if she tampered with fetal remains? If the if the fetal remains are just clumps of cells. If the babies are just clumps of cells, like I could, I could clip my fingernails and someone could handle that. And it's just a clump of cells. It doesn't matter. There's no moral value. It doesn't, there, there, I wouldn't be committing some crime if I clipped my fingernails, just like according to the left, you're not committing any crime if you abort a, a fetus. So if there's, if, it, if it's no big deal, then it's no big deal, right? Unless it is a big deal. And what the left wants is to have it both ways here. The left wants the babies to be clumps of cells for the purposes of killing them, but wants the babies, the aborted babies, to be babies for the purposes of handling them and taking photos, because that would be a crime. Desecrating a body, mishandling a, a, a dead body, that, that would be the crime. But which is it? Certainly, if it's a crime to mishandle the dead body, then it's, a, then it's a crime to make the body dead in the first place by killing the baby. But they want to have it both ways. And they can't have it both ways. Right now, fortunately, you've got some Republicans, Senator James Langford in particular, leading lawmakers to, to call for an investigation of this. All, all of these people should be in prison. The abortionists and the people helping the abortionists. The pro-lifers should immediately be released. This, this is, to my mind, the most important news story in the country right now, that the f- name Cesare Santangelo should be a household name in the United States. He's the worst serial killer in the country right now, if not ever. He's, just, he's the new version of Kermit Gosnell. That was another a, a, a butcher, an absolute butcher abortionist who, again, the media completely blacked out his story. That name should be everywhere. You should call your congressman, call your senator, call the mayor of D.C., call the FBI, demand investigations into this guy, demand that these pro-lifers led by Lauren Handy be released. They're not, they're going to try to sweep this under the rug. Do not let them sweep this under the rug. This is the, this is the most important story in the country right now. The left has become so much more aggressive even than they were on abortion. I used to tell a kind of dark joke. I used to say, that the, the libs, pretty soon, they're going to be pushing for fourth trimester abortions, right? And this, no matter how extreme the, the libs got, I thought, fourth trimester, okay, there's no way they're actually going to call for the killing of babies after they've been born. And then you saw a little weakening of that. You saw partial birth abortion, first of all, in the 1990s. And then they got rid of that. That was made illegal. Then you saw Ralph Northam, the former Democrat governor of Virginia, who said, well, if a baby were born after, an, you know, if he had lots of abnormalities, you were born after a botched abortion, we would put that baby on the table and make that baby comfortable and then have a conversation with the mother and see if she wanted to kill him or not. I thought, you're actually talking about a fourth trimester abortion. And then lawmakers in California, Democrats in California, just proposed a law that would allow parents to kill their babies after they were born. 
potentially for weeks after they were born. Uh, when, when my colleagues told me about this bill, I thought, okay, you've been spending a little too much time on some of those internet forums. Okay, you've been going down the conspiracy theory rabbit holes. This is completely nonsense. But you and I both know that today, the difference between a conspiracy theory and the truth is about six to nine months. In this case, it was about six to nine minutes. California Assembly Bill 2223 was introduced by Assemblyman Buffy Wicks, who's a Democrat from Oakland, And she, in this bill, would have forbidden law enforcement from charging any woman for any action or inaction that affects her, quote, pregnancy outcome, including miscarriage, stillbirth, or abortion, or perinatal death. Perinatal death refers to not just death immediately before birth, but death in the period after birth as well. I know that PolitiFact and Snopes and all those liberal propagandist hacks who work in tandem with big tech to suppress conservatives, I know they're going to try to give me a fact check, 27 Pinocchios, totally false pants on fire rating here. I'm just quoting the bill. I'm just quoting the bill in plain words. And I know, I know they're going to try to redefine all of these words, but that's what they're saying. They're saying mothers can kill their kids after they're born. That is how pro-abortion the California Democrats are. Now, since there has been an outcry among conservatives, they are amending this bill. So this is not going to go through, but they put it in there. And it's very difficult to understand how you put that phrase in there unintentionally. Remember last week we talked about a bill in Tennessee and the bill in Tennessee was going to Uh, create a new carve out for marriage to protect pastors and county clerks from having to engage in what is called same sex marriage for people who believe that actually no marriage just necessarily involves sexual difference. Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy can redefine marriage all he wants, but that doesn't actually change the definition of marriage. The definition of marriage is the same as it's been everywhere all around the world for all of human history. And some Looney Tune liberal Supreme Court justice can't change that. So it gave a carve out to protect people from violating their conscience and from violating reality. But one of the consequences of this was the bill was sort of sloppily written and it seemed like it could get rid of an age requirement to get married. So the Democrats jumped on this and said the the Republicans are pushing for pedophilia and child abuse and child brides. Obviously, that was never the case. The people who drafted the law never thought that was the case, and then they quickly corrected it. You can see how that accident might end up in the law. Oh, oops, we were changing the statute here. We forgot to include this position, this particular line, and therefore, through this omission, maybe it could be confusing as to what the age is. That's not what's going on in the California bill. They included the phrase. They said, a woman cannot be prosecuted or held responsible for perinatal death of her kid. Abortion, stillbirth, or perinatal death afterward. They were intending to do this, and then there was an outcry, and then it went away. For now, it's going to come back. And frankly, they should keep it in. They should keep it in. If we're going to have legal abortion, then you should be able to kill your kid a week after he's born. It's the same thing. Do, Do you really believe, does anyone really believe that a baby is categorically different five minutes before he's born than five minutes he's after, he, after he's born? No, of course not. And yet, in m- multiple states, in New York famously, in Colorado, and lots of other states, you can kill a baby up until the moment of birth. Forget five minutes. Five seconds before birth, you can kill the baby. Five seconds after, after birth, you can't. Did did something change? Well, the political circumstance changed because no longer is the baby inside the woman. But the baby itself didn't change. And we're talking about the morality of killing the baby. So if if it's immoral to kill the baby when he's outside of the mother's womb, that that would be a a violation of that child's rights, that that would be an assault on that child's humanity, surely the baby would be in exactly the same condition two seconds before he were born. At, At least this, I'll give her credit, Buffy Wicks, at least she's consistent. If you're going to have legal abortion, you might as well legalize it for weeks and weeks after the baby is born. Usually the libs are subtler, though. There was a headline. I have to get to it. I meant to get to it last week, and we didn't have time. There's a headline in the Washington Post. Here's the headline. Couple sues fertility clinic saying they had to abort stranger's baby. There is so much in this article. This news report is, is probably the most pregnant 
pun very much intended, dense, interesting news report that, that I've read in months. First of all, that word had is doing a lot of work here. A couple sues fertility clinics saying they had to abort the stranger's baby. You never have to abort any baby. And frankly, even in the case of, of an ectopic pregnancy, which is the one, the one case in which a baby really could pose a threat to the life of the mother, even then you can treat the condition with, through the double effect of not actually going through and directly committing the abortion. That's a topic for a bioethical conversation another day. All of it to say, there is no case in which you have to have an abortion. And certainly not in this case. The baby didn't pose any threat to the mother. And yet what happened? Well, using in vitro fertilization, this couple found themselves in a strange predicament. They, they couldn't conceive on their own. They went to this in vitro place. They spent a lot of money. They did all sorts of things in different cups and different test tubes. And they created lots and lots of little embryos. That is, human beings were created by scientists in a lab, most of whom were supposed to just be frozen forever or killed later on, have those embryos destroyed. Some of them might have been killed through abortion, depending on how the process went. And whoopsie daisy, they switched the test tubes. And so this couple got someone else's baby. And then they didn't notice it for weeks and weeks and months and months and months. This went on, I think for 24 weeks. They, it, it, this went on for six months. As the six-month date was approaching, right at the end of the second trimester, they realized, okay, it's not my baby. We're going to kill it. And, and the, the point of this article is to make people feel bad for the couple. This, they're murderers, this couple. They killed this baby. Uh, this is a little bit personal for me because, I, you know, I got number two on the way. Child number two is on the way. My second baby is almost exactly at the same stage of development that this baby was when they killed him. We're not talking about a clump of cells. We're talking about, this woman was extremely pregnant. This baby was kicking all of the time. This baby was not only showing up on sonograms as a, as a baby, as very obviously just a fully, you can identify every part on the baby. This baby was kicking, this baby was moving. And this heartless couple killed the baby because, well, he was someone else's baby. It was, it was a stranger's baby. And so it's okay to kill a stranger's baby. And how did they end up in this predicament? This is the really hard part of this conversation. They ended up in this predicament because of the immoral means they used to conceive the baby. I know lots of people use IVF. The pro-life movement doesn't talk about the problems with IVF very much because they've got bigger fr fish to fry, they think, and they're going to focus only on the evil of abortion. And, they're, and because a lot of people conceive using IVF and they're very happy because they deal with infertility and IVF seems to offer them a way out. And, and there's this good end which comes from IVF, which is you get a baby. Sometimes, not always, actually, because IVF is far from 100% success rate. But you get a baby, and so you say, that's a good end. But good ends do not justify immoral means. And I know it's a hard saying, but a pro-life movement that endorses in vitro fertilization and all of these other techniques to create babies is not really going to be a pro-life movement. One, because IVF results in abortion most of the time, or in just freezing souls, little human beings, just putting them in freezers forever. Okay, that's, that's one big problem. It can result in abortion when these kind of mix-ups happen. Even when, and this happens not infrequently, by the way. You don't read about it all the time, but it happens a fair bit. Even when that doesn't happen, you now have babies born to people who are not their parents. And, and in this case, the couple says they didn't want to deal with all the lawsuits of who's really the parent. So you're, you're violating a child's right to be born of his father and mother who are joined together in marriage. Often it's used for the purpose of intentionally depriving a child of his mother or father because of single people or same-sex couples using this process. What's wrong about it at the heart, though, is not even any of these consequences, which, and there are lots of consequences of it. It's that it's just, it's simply wrong in and of itself. If we're putting technology at the heart of human reproduction, we're making a big mistake. If we're putting people in lab coats and tinkers and scientists and bureaucrats and some, and 
sometimes the government, at the heart of human reproduction, we're making a ghastly, dystopian, horrible mistake. And you're seeing the consequences of this. I, I remember in the Bible, people suffer infertility in the Bible a lot. And very often, these people, especially in the Old Testament, take matters into their own hands and they say, okay, I'm going to get a concubine. I'm going to have a wife with my, or I'm going to have a child with my wife's maid. I'm gonna, and it never works out. It never works out. And it turns out there's actually wisdom in that old book. It's not, it doesn't work well when we say, okay, I'm going to commit this one immoral act because it has such a good end. I know, I know it can be difficult. That's, that's why these examples are in the Bible. That's why these examples recur throughout literature. That's why they resound so strongly in our souls. But you, you can't, you can't cover every consequence in your own head. You can't recreate the world using your own unfettered reason. Things are going to go awry. Speaking of subtlety, speaking of immoral means toward supposedly just ends, you remember that there was that group of far right wing militiamen who kidnapped Governor Gretchen Whitmer, or they were planning to the Democrat governor of Michigan. Remember that? And they, these men, they were far right radicals. That's why we got to clamp down on conservatives. And then things got a little weird. Then it turned out, hold on, were there some federal agents here? How did they uncover the plot in the first place? Okay, there were some, there were some feds who were embedded with them and they spied and they blew the whistle. And that, well, hold on, wait, were the feds involved in instigating the, well, that's kind of weird. Well, now we've got a verdict here. The guys are going to walk. There are two guys from the Whitmer plot who pled guilty and cooperated with the feds. They, they're going to suffer some consequences, but the ones who pled not guilty, they're going to walk. The jury found that, found in some cases them not guilty and in other cases couldn't reach a verdict. And why? Because the feds entrapped them. I, I'm beginning to think that now whenever I hear about a far right-wing radical plot, I just assume it was instigated by the federal government. Do you remember there was the Justice for January 6th rally? The Justice for January 6th rally was a rally to, because unfortunately for the federal government, they couldn't arrest enough people on January 6th, the greatest, worst coup d'etat insurrection in American history. So they tried to recreate it. And when you looked at the crowd that was there, it was about 90% media then 8% feds, and then 2% some guys wandered in from Appalachia. They didn't get the memo that it was all fake. There was that, that photo of these guys who had just had a fresh haircut, almost certainly at the Pentagon or at Langley. <laughs> they, they were all wearing the same logo-free clothing, the same Garmin watch, the same shades, all checking their, checking their five, checking their sevens, all around. They, they stuck out like a sore thumb. And it was clear that it was all just feds. They were all just trying to entrap everybody. They said, hey, come on. Come on, do a terrorism. Come on, right-wingers. Come on, just do an insurrection. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going on here. I'm beginning to think, well, I've thought this for a long time, actually, that the Ku Klux Klan or any of whatever neo-Nazi groups in America is just all feds, and they're all just spying on each other. And maybe like one guy who wandered in from the backwoods didn't know he was there. So this is good. This is good news. This is justice for people who were entrapped. Just a vindication for right-wingers who were wrongly smeared by the libs. And it's just, a, it's just another hoax perpetrated by the deep state. The Russia hoax was probably the clearest one. Then there was the Ukraine hoax. Remember that Trump had a phone call with Ukraine and they're going to impeach him over that. And then there were, there were all of these hoaxes. January 6th, we were told, was the most violent, awful insurrection. And the conservatives were there cl clubbing police officers over the head and killing them. All of that was fake. All of that was made up, and now even the New York Times and Washington Post admits it. So the next time you hear one of these stories, maybe just hang back a little. Maybe say, you know, I'm going to wait until some more information comes out. Speaking of crime, Kim Kardashian, her favorite hobby, other than dating these sort of meth head looking people from Saturday Night Live, her favorite hobby is trying to spring criminals from prison. She loves it. This is one of the things that really harmed the Trump administration is that the Trump administration, which was brought to power on really popular issues, get tough on crime, get tough on the border, bring some sense and stability back to our country. Well, he ended up pushing this jailbreak bill and he did it in large part because of the advocacy of people like Kim Kardashian. 
who say, well, these poor people who are in prison, they were unfairly convicted, or even so, their sentence was too harsh, even if they did the crime. So Kim Kardashian recently has gone too far, apparently even for her and her handlers. She's been trying to get uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott to stop the execution of a mother who brutally beat and murdered her two-year-old daughter. So this mother, her name is Melissa Lucio, she pled guilty to the crime. And Kim Kardashian said, no, it was a false confession. She didn't really do it. K- uh, Melissa Lucio's daughter, Mariah, uh, was found dead. And she had a uh, a weeks old broken arm. The arm had been broken for weeks, but no one had treated it. She had bite marks on her body. She had patches of hair missing. And so the mother was arrested for kill. Oh, and, and when the mother was arrested, by the way, she was asked, how did the, how did the little girl die? And the, and the mother said, she fell down the stairs. This is the oldest line in the book for people who abuse their spouses and abuse their families. She said she fell down the stairs. And that's what Kim Kardashian was pushing. Then, by the way, they, they did an examination of how the girl died. She didn't die from falling down the stairs. She died from blunt force trauma. Melissa Lucio had 13 other kids who were not in particularly great shape either. And this poor little girl was killed. And now Kim Kardashian begging, begging to free this woman. Obviously, she, she should not be. But K- Kardashian's not alone here. The, the, the real issue with the Katanji Jackson confirmation is this issue. And I'm not even just talking about child abuse because Katanji had this, this weird history of letting child rapists and, and pedophiles off the hook. It's this issue of always taking the side of the criminal to the neglect of the victim. That the criminal must always have been done wrong by society. And what we need to do is just let them off the hook, reduce sentences, let them out of jail, abolish prisons if we can, defund the police. That's the problem. That's what they say. Now, obviously, that, that premise is not right. But it's a premise that totally pervades the left. It gets back to that question Tom Cotton asked. He said, you, 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 Judge Jackson, you spent your whole sentencing here talking about how sorry you felt for the perpetrator of the crime. Do you feel any sorrow for the victim? Or no, you're only taking the criminal side. And it just gets to, down to a fundamental view of how we, how we see the world. Do you believe... That, that men are perfect, we're born perfect, there's no original sin, and the only way we're corrupted is by society, and society, how society got corrupted, that's another question, and society's so broken, and these poor criminals, they're put upon, they never had a chance, and we've got we've to be really good to them. We've got to give them a second, third, fourth, 75th, 127th chance. Or do men have some corruption in their hearts? Is this a broken world, and is the best way to deal with that corruption to, to pursue justice, real justice, for victims and for the criminals, by the way, to help reform their ways? Which is it? Which is, are we going to end up with utopia if we just tweak a few more laws, or do we need to perpetually deal with crime and pursue justice? The latter is the conservative point of view. The former is the liberal point of view. It's pushed by Kim Kardashian and Judge Jackson and everyone in between. We've got a Kardashian on the court now. And we're talking about our basic premises of criminal justice. One, one ought to pray for our country with, with that kind of point of view on the court. I'm Michael Knowles. This is the Michael Knowles Show. I'll see you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. On the Matt Wall Show, we talk about the things that matter. Real issues that affect you, your family, our country. Not just politics, but culture, faith, current events. All the fundamentals. If they matter to you, come check out the show. 